Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here from New York. It's much warmer here, I'll say. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, wonderful to make the trip down. So as Beverly mentioned, I'm Joanne Campbell Ford, and my colleague Caroline Stover and I are thrilled to be here today to speak about human rights as a framework for advancing dignity and equality, a theme that's already been mentioned by, uh, by Mayor Dean. We represent the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School, which supports federal, state, and local government efforts to promote fundamental human rights for all. And I want to say thank you to all the, the commissioners um, and to Beverly and Susanna for, for having us here today. We're very excited to be here in Tennessee, which has a long legacy of struggle for equality and justice as part of the civil rights movement and beyond, as, as we've heard this morning. There's a deep history of connecting the struggle for democracy and equality to human rights. And just a year before he was assassinated, Dr. King proclaimed that we have moved from an era of civil rights to an era of human rights. And his call was a recognition that even with voting rights and civil rights secured, a more holistic approach was needed to, uh, to ensure true equality. And we're honored to be with the Tennessee Human Rights Commission as they carry the torch in the effort to advance human rights. The Commission's call for public comment provides an opportunity to take stock and to generate creative solutions to many of the issues facing Tennesseans. And we hope to enrich the dialogue by offering a national perspective on efforts to advance human rights. So many of the problems facing Tennessee today are problems that a traditional civil rights approach has been unable to tackle. And despite great strides in law, many problems remain. Tennessee ranks fifth in the nation for women murdered by men in intimate partner violence. There were approximately 10,000 homeless people in Tennessee last year, and the poverty rate here is about 3% higher than the national average. And speakers today will focus much more on these human rights issues and, and with specificity in Tennessee and in Nashville. But I wanted to mention that while these problems are local, they are not just affecting Tennesseans. Nationally, we have a crisis in criminal justice, in education, and in inequality. So what can we do? Well, I'm also here because I think this is a time to be optimistic, and I think all of your presence here uh, confirms this. And protecting human rights is, in fact, one of our nation's core founding values. And in recent years, state and local governments across the country have been increasingly turning to human rights principles as tools to promote justice and opportunity. And many of you are probably familiar with human rights, but I want to take a moment to clarify what I'm talking about. And these are principles that are found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a number of treaties. And these human rights standards affirm the dignity and worth of every single person. They're premised on notions of fairness and equality for all, and these standards recognize that civil rights and economic and social rights are intimately connected. Human rights also place an obligation on government to take steps to respect and protect these rights. And they recognize, in many cases, a more robust spectrum of rights than provided for under federal and state law. And Caroline will describe some specific examples of how local governments are using human rights, but I want to just touch on why we think a human rights lens is useful. Importantly, human rights play, place the focus on preventing discrimination and addressing its underlying causes, something the Commission has been at now for, for just 50 years. Um, human rights call on the government to examine the impact of policies on all members of a community and to take steps to alleviate practices that perpetuate discrimination and inequality. The emphasis is on being proactive and forward-looking. And importantly, under a human rights frame, discrimination is broadly defined to include policies with a discriminatory impact regardless of their intent. And finally, I think important for today, for the Commission and for local government, a human rights approach emphasizes transparency, accountability, and participation. And for all these reasons, it's really valuable that the Tennessee Commission is a human rights commission. Human rights are often considered international. We sometimes get funny looks when we say, oh, we do human rights in the US, and people say, huh? Um, but as Eleanor Roosevelt said, human rights begin in small places close to home. And the federal government has recognized that making human rights real depends on state and local governments in the United States. Indeed, ensuring human rights requires cooperation and collaboration between federal, state, and local governments, along with local residents. And not surprisingly, in the U.S., while bipartisan gridlock has stalled much positive legislation at the national level, Local governments are leading the way for change. 
And the local actors embracing human rights have seen some positive benefits. Uh, it's notable, I think, that just last June, the US Conference of Mayors, which I think Mayor Dean uh, is part of, committed to promote and uphold human rights at their annual meeting. And just this March, the Attorney General of Mississippi and the Mayor of Salt Lake City went to the United Nations as part of a U.S. delegation to share their local human rights efforts and highlight some of the challenges they face. So state and local human rights commissions, like Tennessee's, are key to making human rights real. Indeed, institutional change cannot occur without a sustained focus on ways to eradicate discrimination and promote equal opportunity. Undoubtedly, many, many challenges face state and local government actors. But despite these challenges, a number of jurisdictions are embracing human rights as a roadmap for change, and we're gonna to turn to those now. Thank you, Joanne. Um, we wanna mention just a few examples of efforts being undertaken today across the country to promote and protect human rights. They inspire us, and we hope that they inspire you. Um, first are initiatives to advance women's equality. In 1998, San Francisco adopted a local ordinance based explicitly on the International Treaty on the Rights of Women. The goal of the ordinance was to eliminate gender inequality. Agencies underwent an assessment of services, employment practices, and the budget to identify discriminatory practices and worked to correct these inequalities. Tangible results included efforts to expand the recruitment pool to include women and minorities, leading to increased employment numbers and new laws on telecommuting and paid parental leave. An increase in street lights resulted from consultations showing women felt unsafe on city streets. <coughs> After holding hearings on women's equality issues, other cities like Salt Lake City are contemplating a similar ordinance. <coughs> Efforts to improve government decision making are also taking hold. Eugene, Oregon has introduced the Triple Bottom Line tool, which analyzes proposed policy and program changes for potential impacts on human rights. Agencies have used this tool when facing fiscal challenges. As one example, the Recreation Department was able to develop a budget that minimized the impact on services and accessibility while increasing revenue. Cities are also embracing the right to be free from domestic violence. Since 2001, 11 cities and counties in the United States have adopted resolutions declaring freedom from domestic violence as a human right from Montgomery, Alabama, to Travis County, Texas, and Baltimore, Maryland. These demonstrate support for a new prevention-oriented approach rooted in the recognition of governmental responsibility to ensure this right. Several of these resolve for government to use human rights principles in their work or call on the government to assess existing solutions and recommend change. Many cities are addressing criminal criminalization of homelessness through human rights. In January of 2014, Duluth, Minnesota became the first city to pass a Homeless Persons Bill of Rights. The resolution acknowledges the importance of ensuring an adequate standard of living, including food, clothing, and housing, a core element of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It sets up mechanisms to focus on eliminating hunger, homelessness, and poverty. Several states have recently enacted Homeless Bills of Rights as part of a growing effort to combat criminalization of homelessness which diverts funding from constructive solutions and exacerbates the cycle of poverty. Cities have also passed resolutions to address the need for affordable and accessible housing. And there are also state efforts to advance health equity. The state of Vermont recently passed universal health care legislation based on human rights principles and committed to creating a state budget designed to address the needs of the people in Vermont in a way that advances human dignity and equity. The healthcare principles focus on equity, universality, transparency, accountability, and participation. This is just a sample of the initiatives taking place across the country driven by local communities. Here in Tennessee, the Human Rights Commission is also advancing this work by holding hearings this spring and by fulfilling its mandate every day. These are critical steps in improving the human rights of those in Tennessee. And while state and local governments are at the forefront of protecting and promoting human rights, the federal government also has a huge role to play in this work. That is why we advocate extensively with, with federal agencies to provide increased financial resources, training, and education on human rights. We applaud the daily efforts of the Tennessee Human Rights Commission to identify and address discrimination and push forward the human rights of all. To advance human rights, we must all work together and would love to speak further with any of you who are interested in learning more about our work or the 
growing domestic human rights movement. Together we can bring human rights home. So it actually, if there are business folks in the room, it's, it comes from, uh, it's really a corporate decision-making tool, but the way they use it in, in Eugene is when a policy or decision is proposed, they run through a series of questions um, about what are the potential impacts on particular communities, what are the fiscal impacts, are there any communities that will be impacted more negatively than others, um, and are there ways to mitigate uh, what are the foreseen negative impacts and amplify the positive results. Um, so it's really, it doesn't necessarily trigger any stop to a policy, but it's a way for folks within city government to assess what the impacts will be. And we're happy to share a copy of that with you all. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. 